This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, legends. Thanks very much for joining me. I've got a chat with Mark Whalen from Fuming Mouth to share with you. The reason for the chat is the new album from the group. It's titled Last Day of Sun. It is out now. In this episode, we delve into the album, but we go far deeper. Mark has recently beaten cancer, leukemia. Good on him. And the album, does it reflect his battle, his health battle? Well, we'll find out. They're on the road, so you'll hear that he's in a van traveling to a gig somewhere across continental United States. So I've got a tune to share with you. I have chosen The Silence Beyond Life. And once it's done, you'll hear from Mark. Let's go. Yeah. 
Mate, you're on tour, eh? You're on the road. We're on the road. We got uh, Pat driving over here. Hi, mate. And Andrew. James is in the back there, too. We got the whole band in here, but um, yeah, we're in Iowa and we're heading to heading to Denver, Colorado. Oh, sweet. All right. Well, safe travels. I hope everything is uh, safe for you on that journey out that way then. So, yeah. What's your hometown, mate? Where are you from originally? Boston. You're pretty far away from where you where you live then, I suppose, are you? Aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. We're pretty far away from uh, the East Coast at this point. Yeah. Cool, mate. All right. I'll kick things off then. Um, Mark, so look, last day of the sun. I enjoy the album. It's hey, a Andrew, is this um, is this a video interview or just audio? No, nah, just audio. I'll just do audio. It's just nice to see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, look, last day of the sun. Look, it's it. It sounds like it's a cathartic journey for you. It was inspired in part by your your battle with cancer. Now, here's the thing. I, there might be out there, but I'm not aware of another album in extreme metal that deals with the subject matter. So, can you talk me through the process of how you channeled your thoughts and how you made decisions about channeling what you went through into emotion and emo- the emotions and turn that into brutal extreme metal? Well, at first, the album was not like that. I saw the title in the first five minutes of the movie, 30 Days of Night, and the screen flashes black and it just says Last Day of Sun. And I was like, is that the next album title? And that, that's where it really all started. Uh, it had nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with cancer. It's a, it's a concept about, you know, the sun going out and, um, a town going into mayhem thinking the sun's going out, but really there's a massive monster in the way of the sun, Um, you know, to not get too much into the themes, it started out as, you know, fiction. And then it kind of became real and talking, going to the effect of what you said, um, a song like kill the diseases about it. And that was very hard to put pen to paper. Cancer can't kill me. And, uh, I didn't want to, and I wanted to make it vague at first with that song. I wanted it to be like just about disease in general. And I just sat there and I was like, I have to say the things that can't kill me, that can't kill all of us. And that's, that's why I hope when people hear it. So it was, uh, I gotta be honest. It just kind of came to mind over matter and then just, literally writing a lot of those words down in that song. And I think that kind of goes across the album from front to back, mind over matter. Mm. Hey, I could be wrong, um, but I think Nurgle, uh, Adam from Behemoth, went through the same thing that you you recovered from as well. So have you guys crossed paths? We haven't crossed paths yet. Um, yeah, he, he had acute myeloid leukemia, not just like a parallel thing. Like, And he ha- also had a bone marrow transplant. And uh, we haven't crossed paths, to be honest, as a survivor, if I put myself in his shoes and he's like cruising past a decade easy, um, I, I, if I was him, I, I don't know if I want to talk about it that much. So if I if we do cross cross paths ever with Nurgle, I hope I hope we play some ripping gigs. We go shopping at the mall. Um, we do, we do everything that doesn't involve cancer and don't talk about it and talk about living. You know what I mean? And we party together, have some fun. That's what I want to do with that guy. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Hey, did faith or a spiritual process? Was that, was that part of your recovery at all? Um, what, what do you mean by like spiritual? Um, well, it's not always about Christianity these days in the West, even though I'm Catholic and I still believe in that. But some people yeah. lead to like Christian Krishna consciousness and some Hinduism, this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe there is like a North Star in all of us. I believe in the soul and I believe that, you know, the soul can be fed and then the soul can feed as well. And, you know, that's where the ideas of like seven deadly sins like gluttony comes about, you know, cause people who only feed their own soul as opposed to feeding other people's and selfishness. And yeah, I mean, a lot of that, a lot of those ideas developed in my mind, you know, when I was getting in the hospital, I couldn't really see anyone, but they did have this one person, uh, the chaplain. And she goes around like visiting people. Cause you can't have like a priest in there for last rites. Cause there's so many people that have all that have all different religions and beliefs. So a chaplain with in all things spiritual. And I would talk to her sometimes about it. And um yeah, it was really nice like 
hearing it from someone's perspective where her belief doesn't lie in a single religion and more it's more about her understanding and knowledge lies in anything that anyone believes in. And, and that's kind of how I approach it now. And I kind of just try and have an open mind to everything. Um, you know, and there's just take that there's validity for a lot of people's beliefs. Hmm. Do, do current affairs and social issues, I mean, God, we're living through this epoch where we've got some awareness of what's going on in the far reaches of the globe. So unlike any other time in history is one we're living through now in that regard. So do current affairs, social issues, or even politics, do they even enter your uh, your thinking when you're writing lyrics? Yeah, definitely. They, I, it, it has entered it in the past too. I mean, um, one of the first songs to me about ever wrote, the very first one, uh, Executioner Sabbath, really had to deal with, uh, had to deal with a lot of people's political beliefs and a lot, a lot of things that people say when they just want to be heard as opposed to like having a conversation or something like that. So female mouth politically can be vague, but um, it definitely is shaped by what you're talking about. Yes. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Just onto the release strategy around last day of the sun. Look, look, these days, it's not a given that bands will keep on releasing albums. You've got bands these days, particularly ones that are starting out, that just do singles or EPs or even three-song releases. I don't know whether they could be called EPs or what have you. But, look, you've got a fair few uh, records and uh, releases out there, but it's only your second album, so I think you've tapped into a little bit of that too. But was it a given for you that this collection of songs was going to be released as an album? Oh, absolutely. Uh, leading up to it, it was like... Uh we did have an EP in singles and those were songs that I viewed that weren't good enough to make it to the full length album, so to say. So it was always uh, goal number one since, you know, I was watching 30 days of night um, has always been to make an album and make a good album and make those songs make sense and make, make good songs. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I like that the band sound too incorporates uh, an early sweet death element. So was that was that Gotham? Absolutely. Thing? Yeah, was that a huge influence on you guys? Uh, Stockholm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hundred percent Stockholm scene and uh, Sunlight Studio sound. Um, anything from Sumerian Cry to Left Hand Path. Um, they're all really important to Fuming Mouth sound sonically and aesthetically too like, if anything it's like i think our we the band is like kind of try to try to reach towards you know higher heights and like deep towards like deeper roots and uh just try and grow is ultimately what it is and at the root is definitely in your words sweet death it's, de it's definitely influenced by it and mm. finished death metal too don't get me wrong like demolic is important to us uh amorphous is another one you know um so th there's a lot there's a lot of influences you think you'll be hitting up dan swano or frederick nordstrom sometime in the future dude that'd be a dream come true especially with this album everyone's like no one's ever sang in death metal before dan swano is just working hard every day just putting out the greatest material you got uh yeah i, I won't even go any further into it it, it, would, it would be fantastic so mm, yeah. I hope it happens, especially now that you're on nuclear blast. So it's a distinct possibility. Right, right. Yeah, could always happen there, mate. There's only a few degrees of separation between you got you guys and what's happening over there. So what's um you're clearly on tour at the moment, but obviously being Australian, I'm always interested when bands if bands have plans to come down here, mate. So is that on the agenda? Yeah, I mean, we've talked to so many people from Australia today and yesterday. We we have to do it. There's no other way. Um, I'm not sure when we hit Australia, but I know, I know we can't wait. I traveling for, um, to the Netherlands and traveling to Germany to play, you know, really big festivals. It, it was just a once in a lifetime opportunity that most people don't get to do. And if we get to do that in Australia, we're coming down with everything fuming mouth can give and we're putting on the best performance possible. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So you've been speaking to us for the last for the last few days. What's your is that the first opportunity you've had to interact with the Australian media types? 
Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. How have you found us compared to conversations and interviews that you've been doing with the rest of the world? Um, I love Australia and Australians because everyone I've talked to is really focused on the music. They, you, everyone has their own y- unique questions that are focused on the band. No one has phoned it in, so to say, and um, or faked it. And I'm not saying that some other people have or haven't, but uh, you know, in the U.S., it's you have one amazing interview and then you have one that kind of boggles your mind and makes you a little confused. And um, in, there hasn't been any of that with anyone from Australia, which has been really refreshing. Mm. I agree with you. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, oh, thank you for the compliments about the Australian side of things. But oh, look, I've listened to, I've been doing this seven years now and I've, I don't know whether it's improving, to be quite honest with you, the quality of podcasting and conversations and interviews out there. I think there's a lot of people that are phoning it in just because of the ubiquitous nature of youtube and yeah and clicks is that you're obviously finding the same thing yeah yeah absolutely and like uh even right there we're like uh should we just do these all in the van and uh you know it kind of came down to me being like no let's we we should really pull over and try and you know try and at least give like a genuine conversation i know you and i are speaking in the van but i, I figure i'm like well this this one's not on video and we're kind of wrapping things up and I'm drinking a Baja Blast. So I feel kind of lit right now. And uh, yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in good spirits. So, I, you know, me not both of us just speaking like this, I think uh, is as good as a guess, you know. Sweet. I'm curious. What's a Baja Bliss? I've never heard of it. It's like um, it's a Mountain Dew, but it's like uh, instead of green, it's like sea foam green. <laughs> and it's basically uh, you can only get a Taco Bell and it's uh, it's delicious. I remember as a kid, obviously growing up here, mate, like we only had like Coke, Fanta, maybe there was something else. I don't know. There was like four drinks you could buy, right? Then when we went yeah. to the US and there was like, a, I'm not even joking, like a thousand different varieties. So you got raspberry Coke and raspberry Pepsi and all of this sort of stuff. And, but now everything's sort of flattened out and you can go to Iceland and you can get something similar to what you're talking about now. But I've just got that memory of going to the US first time in year 2000 or 1999, I think it was. And to your point, you've got all these wonderful, uh, you know, they're soft drinks, but, mate, what an interesting time. What what, what a wonderful plethora of uh, flavours and varieties of food you got over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, man, we do it all. <laughs> hey, uh, what's your ideal tour? What does that look like? Um, Us headlining, you know, uh, it, it's difficult. Like, uh, coming back from being, having cancer and stuff has been super hard. We haven't, I think, like, after the pandemic happened. We were like, let's come back. Let's headline. And then it's just so being a headliner, it's, it's so hard to like organize that. And people don't realize like what goes on behind the scenes. And we haven't really gotten a shot to do that. But as far as an ideal tour goes, I don't care if it's. Mm, yeah. I don't care if it's 200 people or 2000, you know, it, it's fuming mouth headlining and us really just like creating uh, a certain environment. Uh, that everyone that's inclusive allows everyone to be involved and uh, accepts like everyone, all walks of life. And that's kind of what this tour is too. And I, I really like that. And, um, but it's, it's headlining in one way, shape or form. Okay. Sweet. And, yeah. so, and so we can play more songs. Yeah, that too. Definitely. What, what are you getting at the moment? About 40 minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just shy of that. Um, we, we got to play an extra one last night and uh, we played uh, They Take What They Please. It was rocking. The house was shaking. It was cool. Mm. Who, who are you on tour with at the moment? Uh, Devil Master and Final Gasp. Devil Master. They're an interesting band to say the least. Yes. <laughs> How do you find the audience responds to you guys and then to them? Um, We're definitely like on... It's funny. We're def- we definitely have two very different fan bases, but at their core, um, I think our fan bases are very introverted, and uh, they 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 are one in the same, even though they are different. Meaning, you know, we might have somebody in a camo hat, and they might have somebody in a cape, but you'd yeah. be surprised how much similarity there is between those two people at our shows. Yeah. 
I uh, I looked, I, I saw with interest, um, I, I used to follow a lady who was a void worshipper, just in terms of I'm interested in what she gets into, called Erica Fravel. So she was a Satanist who became a void worshipper. She did their album artwork. Now, if you get a chance, I, I guess that's what's on there. Oh, Francis yeah. told me. Yes. She yeah. lives in uh, New Hampshire, I think. I, th- I think so. New England, certainly up in that north northeast corner there. That's New England, yeah. Yeah. That area. But she's a fascinating lady, mate, if you get to talk to him in a bit more detail about her, yeah. I definitely will, yeah. He he told me about her before. I went over. Uh, he was playing He was playing in this other band, and uh, we toured with him, and I got to meet him. I went to his I, – he, I went in his room, and he like, showed me the art and was, like, telling me all about her, yeah. I'll plant the seed. Maybe maybe you guys could work with her because I think she's got she's tapped into some pretty interesting stuff to say the least, esoteric stuff. And uh I'd love yes. to see more of her stuff on artwork, to be honest with you, mate. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely a theme of female mouth. So that's that sounds like it's uh in our wheelhouse. Hmm. Hey, just to expand on a topic we touched on a, a couple of minutes ago, uh media and heavy metal. Do in 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 general, do you feel as though that fans out there do do you feel as though they can handle the literature component, or do you think that they're more tuned into video and the social media side of things? I can't tell. I can't. I, I, I part of me is like I think everyone wants to disconnect, and then the next thing I notice, people are gauging everything on social media, and. Um, I think we're in a state of entropy and there's a mild disorder and confusion and you know, that, that state will pass, but you know, it really comes down to like, I, the, the decision-making that people do and uh, you know, how they go about it, I think. So I think it's kind of just a very much a hold on for dear life kind of moment for society if you will and uh, i do believe things will turn to uh, get to a point where technology and like just just consuming all whether it's a vinyl you know talking specifically about music i kind of got into a broader sense of what's going on but whether it's physical vinyl or whether you're listening on spotify i think we will kind of hit like either uh you know one shape or another there will be more order and uh, a lot, a lot clearer idea of what is going on. Mm. Do you think Spotify is a the utility in it? Do you think it's a net benefit or the opposite? Um, I think it is um, the. What I think it is the staple. I think it is the the main beacon of what you know where people tend to go to um i you know regardless of it being positive or negative i think it exists and i think you know same with apple music and everything but i don't think but that doesn't stop the fact that i can go on youtube and dig up any death metal demo i want right now i can go to a a record store right now and find a vinyl that uh never made it onto the internet and then i find something you know, more useful. So I don't really look at it. Spotify DSPs as negative or positive because I just look at them as something that exists. And the reality is there is a counterbalance to that where you can consume music as well outside of, you know, strict rules and regulations, which Spotify has. Very strict. I noticed uh, was it this week they've released an edict saying that they're not going to pay anybody whose streams are less than a thousand per annum, I should say. Yeah, you hear you hear that? Anyone listening? That means you got to run up the fuming mouth streams. You got to get us to a mil. We need a million monthly listeners. That's what that I, means. Yeah, I think it's an issue it's because good. I didn't dive into the detail. But if they're talking about individual tracks that don't reach that threshold per annum, then that means that most bands made are only going to have five or six or seven songs that hit that threshold. Yeah, I, that, this is what I mean by the state of entropy. It's just too confusing. They can't keep that model. You can't because people will just go other places. It's it's why like uh, SoundCloud became successful as uh you know and didn't die off um in the you know eight years ago. And uh yeah. 
Just just on the on the touring side of thing, then um, I've spoken to quite a few artists about this, and yeah, it's it's a bit a bit of a pernicious issue. This one here from the um, from the uh, venues perspective, in that they're taking a cut of the merchandise. Is that still ongoing for you? Is that something you guys are still having to grapple with? No, we never have to grapple with it because I'm always uh, we're always sneaking out and we're always dodging the merch cuts, and they they can never catch us no matter how hard they try, <laughs> and uh, they'll never catch me. <laughs> i'm serious man like I, I really mean that it's just uh yeah no way dude no way but um that, that's my opinion on it come come catch me come get me what are you doing are you just still... meeting, are you just meeting fans next to your tour bus are you is that how you're doing it what's up are you meeting fans next to, oh are you talking about the money at the end of the night i get you no that's when they come good. at the end of the night i'm just boom 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 i'm running through corners i'm, I'm out of there yeah, <laughs> I got I got the merch packed up. I'm gone. We're a hundred miles away from the venue. <laughs> What's up? Start asking. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna fuming mouth. Actually, the new model is we're we're asking for and Andrew Budway, our guitarist, brought this up. We're gonna ask for a cut of the bar. So that's actually yeah. the new um the new standard that's yeah. gonna be going into venues. Is fuming mouth takes percentage from the bar. So I hope I hope venues are ready for that. Mm. Was was it, was that at a point though, or was it was it always like this, where the 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 cut that the venue was taking was that actually the profit you were making, and you were having to hand that over, or potentially handing well, that over? I'll be honest, we we've always been a like a DIY band. We the only time we've ever played venues that really really strictly um, took cuts was on our tour uh, opening for the Black Dolly Murder, and. That that's the one I was talking about where we were dodging those cuts. Um, at the end of the night, someone would come up to you and ask you about it, and you could tell they don't they don't even wanna they don't even want to take the money from you. You can tell it's just their job and they're hired to do it. And um, it's a really awkward and uncomfortable uh situation that not only the musicians are put in, but um the employees of the venue are put in, promoters are put in, everyone is put in by um people that wrote something in a contract. And uh, that, that's that is the reality of it. Well, I don't understand how the venues think bands can keep on the road. Then, if they're going to take a cut of the only way that you make significant amounts of your money, whatever, whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. We're on a we're on a DIY tour. That's not the reason why, but like uh, we're we're doing that right now. We're doing it, you know, raw dog from the ground up. Um, because we can keep that money uh, 100% every night. And that's, uh, that is good. You know, I do make jokes about it, but it is, um, it is stupid. It is dumb that they do that. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Mate, thanks for the chat. That's it from me. Thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. Godspeed on your travel there to all of you. I hope you're safe and, mate, hope to see you down here sometime soon. Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much, man. You rule. Well, there you have it. Another episode done and dusted. That one featuring Mark Whalen from Fuming Mouth. If you enjoyed that one, go across to scarsandguitars.com. Many more conversations await, especially with the members of Cradle of Filth. I've had many, many chats, and there's a special tab. Click on that link, and you can dive into the world of Cradle of Filth, all the way back to the principle of evil made flesh, and even earlier, the demos, the members of the group that were instrumental in making that band the Colossus they eventually became. All right. Oh, and there's other chats as well. Many other chats. Members of Morbid Angel, Death, Cannibal Corpse. Of course, Eric Rutan is there. Obituary. All of the greats. All the hits. All of the, the best people in extreme metal as far as I'm concerned. And many more to come, I must say, too. I've got some information to share with you about my book because I've written one in the moment, but before we get to that, I'll bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it's a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. 
In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words, uh, sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.